Welcome to Church Online. We're honored to have you spending your time with us. If you're watching for the first time, we want to welcome you as our guest. Today is week two of our series, Operation. Before we begin, here's what's going on and coming up. Here's the latest. Check in on Facebook. This month, every 10 check-ins will provide a day of school for a child in need. Take a moment and fill out your virtual connect card. We would love to know you were here with us today. Has Jesus changed your life? Have you been baptized? Baptism is now available every Sunday at Cultivate. If you would like to be baptized, please let us know on your Connect card. We would love to celebrate with you. Sundays are the most fun day of the week and serving is part of the fun. If you haven't found your team, what are you waiting for? Roots is the place to start. Simply visit the address below to complete Roots Online. We can't wait to serve with you. We are growing our production team. If you're interested in running video cameras, editing, video, photography, and more, we would love for you to serve with us. Let us know on your Connect card today. Our annual mission trip to Juarez, Mexico will be December 6th through the 10th. If you're interested in going, let us know on your Connect card. Our fall small group semester begins in October. If you are interested in leading a group, it's simple and fun. The deadline to submit your group is next Sunday. You can submit your group at the address below. That's all the news for today. If you need more information, let us know on your Connect card. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Church Online. I hope that you're having an incredible week. It's hard to believe that it's already Church Online time again, but I'm glad that you're part of today's online experience with us, especially if you are a guest today. I just want to welcome you. We are in week two of a series that we're calling Operation. Uh, we believe that we are in need of an operation. To have an operation means that there is an incision. It means we go beneath the surface. It means something needs to be repaired or removed in our lives. And it's not hard to look around, to watch the news, to have a conversation with someone, and to quickly understand that we are in need of an operation in our lives. And this whole series is coming out of what I believe is an incredible scripture that actually talks about you and I receiving an operation. In Joel chapter 2, verse 13, here's what it says. Don't tear your clothing in your grief, but tear your hearts instead. Return to the Lord your God, for He is merciful and compassionate. Slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He is eager to relent and not punish. In Old Testament times, you would read that if someone were showing their remorse or their regret, a sign of repentance, they would actually physically uh, tear their clothes. Uh, many of you are more mature than I am maybe, but all I can picture is Hulk Hogan. Come on, you remember Hulk Hogan coming to the ring, ripping the shirt apart, doing the ear thing. That's, that's what I picture when I read about people tearing their clothes in the Bible. But in this context, the author says, you're ripping your clothes and you're letting us know, hey, you're repentant. You're letting us know that there's something that's not right and needs to be repaired in your life. But I say, let's go a step farther from the surface level, from the superficial and there needs to be an incision, there needs to be an operation of the tearing of the heart. Go beyond the clothing, go beyond the surface, go beyond the over-the-counter medication and all of the home remedies that we try to do, and let's get to the core of it, and let's have an operation. Last week, we kicked off this series talking about spiritual surgery. We talked about how we understand in our life that we had a spiritual disease. Every one of us is born with this spiritual disease. The good news is, is that we have a spiritual donor who wants to replace our nature with his, and his name is Jesus. And then we have a spiritual doctor who is the one who performs the operation and provides what we need that we cannot do on our own. And I just want to stop and encourage you that if you did not see or hear last week's message, I just want you to make sure 
that you go back and you either watch or you listen to last week's message. You can find it on our church app, on our Facebook page, on our website, on YouTube, on the church app, on any podcast platform, because that is the foundation of everything that we will build on throughout this series. We learned last week in our week one consultation that the beginning of everything starts with our spiritual life and it builds from there. That's the foundation in which we build on. So today in week two, I've titled your message Pre-Existing Conditions. You may not know this, but you actually have a pre-existing condition. A pre-existing condition is, is the medical uh, issue that you have. It's your ailment. It is your circumstance before you get your health care plan. It's what you're walking into this health care plan with. It's what you're bringing along with you. And so today, I want to talk to us about our pre-existing conditions what we're bringing into this spiritual life, what we're bringing to Jesus, what we've walked into this world with, what are the pre-existing conditions that you and I struggle with? And I believe three of these today are going to be really strong. I believe they're going to be convicting. I believe they're going to be challenging. You know, an operation is not pleasing. It's not something that we look forward to. No, it's invasive. It's a little uncomfortable for us to be split and open and to be repaired and things removed. And today, that's exactly what this message is going to do. I believe it's going to challenge you and it's going to convict you. It may be a little uncomfortable in times, but we know that if we leave this untreated, the Bible told us last week, in the end, it leads to death. And so today, I just want to tackle three areas of our life that I believe are pre-existing conditions. And then I want to talk about three things that we can do in order to overcome it, to be healed from it. I want to give you a health care plan today that's going to set you free from some of these strongholds in your life. But I want to pray for us so that in this moment... God would begin to speak to us right where we are. So Jesus, I love you. Thank you for my friends watching online right now, listening by podcast. I pray there's no distraction. I pray there's nothing happening in the room or in our environment that would keep us from receiving the word that you have for us today. We're honored that you're here with us and that you're speaking to us in Jesus' name. Amen. So I hope you're ready on your outline. I'm going to give you a little medical history and I'm going to take you back to the very beginning. When you talk about your medical history, you go back to the beginning. You actually go back to your family tree. You learn things from your, your, your relatives and from your DNA and from your past and things that have been handed down, your medical traits, and you ask these questions. We talked about it last week, that checkup that you take at the doctor when they want to know everything about you, down to the color socks you're wearing. Come on, sitting in the doctor's office. They get so detailed. Because your family history, your medical history, tells a lot about your health of where you are today. And spiritually, relationally, emotionally, physically, financially, in every area of our life, today we're going to look at that medical history to help determine where we are today. But I want you to go with me to Genesis chapter 3. It's a very famous story out of the Bible. Even if you don't attend church, even if you don't read your Bible, you probably know the story of Adam and Eve. And I want to take you to a moment where we see Eve begin to make some decisions that actually contributed to the medical history, the medical conditions that you and I are carrying today. There are three things that I'm going to talk to you about today that are very evident in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Check this out with me. It says, When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Now, I want you to notice the setup in the context of what's happening here. Is God has created the whole world, and God has created Adam and Eve, and he has given them dominion over everything. In other words, Adam, Eve, you guys are the owners. You run this place. You are the face of the place. You guys are in charge. And anything you want, it's yours, except for there's this one tree, and I want you to stay away from it and just don't eat its fruit. Everything else for you is provided and it's free, and it's good. Have at it. And I don't know about you, but uh, I, I'm kind of a meat eater. I like, I like, I'll skip the vegetables, and I'll skip the fruit every time. 
in order to get to the meat, I like a good buffet where there's plenty of it. And I can take even um, what I would say is quantity over quality. I just like a lot. So for me, I put myself in that scenario and I go, man, I think I could have skipped the fruit on the tree. Yet Eve saw this and it evoked or provoked three different things in her life. You see, the enemy had been there tempting her and talking to her and whispering in her ear. And it began to shift something inside of her to where three things stood out. The first is when she saw the fruit, it said that it was pleasing to the eye. I want you to underline that statement. It was pleasing to her eye. You and I are caught by things that are pleasing to our eye. And also, it was desirable for gaining wisdom. We have this desire to gain and to get. And the Bible says that she saw that it was good for food. Underline that statement, good for food. She saw that it was good, that her eyes were opened. She saw something that she desired. It was pleasing to the eye. In other words, it provided the gain of what she wanted. And it was desirable for gaining wisdom. Those three things are evident in our lives and in our medical history. As a matter of fact, the three things that unfolded here, these temptations that began to be activated in Eve's life, ultimately affecting Adam as well. These are actually warning signs that I want to bring to you today. The Bible actually warns us against these three things. I'm going to read you one more verse of Scripture, and then we're going to break this down so that we can see the three areas of sickness in our life, of the, of the medical history that we're bringing into this. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15-17, through 17, look at it with me. It says, Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not love, uh, you do not have the love of the Father in you. Then verse 16, here's where we connect those dots. For the world offers only a craving for, underline this if you're taking notes, physical pleasure, a craving for, underline, everything we see, and, underline this, a pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father but are from this world. And this world is fading away. Notice this. It's not going to last along with everything that people crave. It's all passing. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. Three things of our medical history today that I want to bring to you that Eve brought destruction and sickness and death and sin the sins of Adam and Eve are cast down on us. We're carrying this pre-existing conditions because of our medical history. And there are three things that will get you and me every time. Most of any of the things that you struggle with, any of the sins, any of the temptations, any of the shortcomings, the problems, the failures, the faults, they all can be equated to these three areas. And number one, write this down, is the pre-existing condition that you are affected by in your medical history is our passion. Our passion. Write that word, passion. The Bible says, for the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure. Now notice that the Bible says the physical pleasure. It is something that... Uh, catches your eye. It is something that you see, that you desire. Typically, we won't notice that this manifests itself in a sexual lust or desire of our life. Remember, Eve saw the fruit. Whenever she saw the fruit and her eye began to see it in a different way, in a way that was in, outside the context and the lens of which God wanted her to see, when she began to see it through the lens of the enemy, it became a temptation for her. And the Bible teaches us all the way in 1 John, a long way from the very first sin, that the world offers a craving for our physical pleasure. And so I want to ask you a few questions today, and this is um, personal to you. It's another checkup that I'm going to ask yourself, a personal checkup. Ask yourself this question, what tempts me? What is it in your life that you find yourself tempted by? Is it lust? Is it sex? 
Is it money? Is it greed? Is it adultery? Come on, we got football coming up, and I know we're going to be focused on football here in the South. Come on, that's bigger than any other day of the week. We'll, we'll cancel the life over a football game, but we'll be a little too tired to show up in God's house. I mean, that's just how we roll here in the South because we are very prone to put things before God, to get them out of order. And so what is it in your life that you see as the physical pleasure that keeps drawing you in, that keeps catching your eye, that keeps catching your attention and drawing you in what tempts you? And then ask yourself this question, when does it tempt me? When are you tempted by these things? Do you notice that for some reason uh, you go to the bar and you are tempted to drink more than you should be drinking? Uh, maybe we shouldn't be in the bar. You know, if you go to the barber shop enough times, eventually you're going to get a haircut. Uh, is it when you're alone and nobody else is around? When you're at home by yourself and nobody's there to see what you're watching on television, what you're listening to, what's on your phone, some of those sites that you are clicking on and some of those places that you're visiting and those images that you're seeing and the videos that you're watching, when are you tempted? When does these temptations typically happen in your life? And then this is an important one. Who tempts me? Who is in your life that is a constant temptation? You're doing really good as a husband until you start hanging out with those guys. And then it changes your attitude. It changes your outlook. It changes your feelings about your relationship and your marriage and all of that stuff. Who, who are you hanging around that is tempting you in areas of your life. Maybe it's those students at school. Maybe it's those teenagers that you're hanging out with. Those kids in your neighborhood. Those moms on your block. Those people at work that are tempting you and you need to set some boundaries in your life. We're going to talk about it. There's a temptation checklist, a process of typically how this goes. The first is a look. You typically see it. Eve saw it. The Bible says that the world offers a craving for our physical pleasure. We begin to see it. We take a look at the temptation. And then you begin to reason. You go, well, it's just one time. It's just one drink. It's just one hour. It's just one video. It's just one picture. It's just one dinner. It's one text. It's one phone conversation. It's one tiny white lie. No one will know it's harmless. Well, the reality is, is you get that look, you begin to reason in your life, and then you take a step into sin. You take a step into it. You embrace it. You begin to do it. And then you begin a cycle. Many of you watching or listening today, you are on a cycle. Nobody else knows it. You're the only one aware of it. You promised yourself you would not do that again. You wouldn't say that again. You wouldn't have that conversation again. You wouldn't make those comments again. You wouldn't go to that place again. You would not look at that again. You wouldn't go to that website again. But yet you find yourself in a continual cycle to where you are convinced that you've gone too far and there is no way out. The pre-existing conditions that we have is our passion. Number two is our possession. The second thing we see is our possession. Notice 1 John 2.16, it says a craving for everything that we see. You see, when Eve saw that apple with her eyes, she then began to say, it is pleasing. She began to notice something that was going to provide for her appetite. She said that when she saw that it was good for food, and then pleasing to the eye, it was desirable. It was going to fix that appetite. It was going to provide for something that was going to make her happy. We think our possessions and everything that we can get makes us happy. We are self-centered, selfish, self-righteous, self-gaining people. We just are. Everything about our life. We're born to say, mine, my, give me, I want, give me more. I've got one, but I really want two. I mean, we're never satisfied. Every one of us fall into this category that no matter how much we have, we want just a little bit more. And then when we get it, 
and we are fulfilled by it, it's fleeting because something new is right around the corner. We have a craving for everything we see. We have an appetite. You see, it's our eye. It catches us first. It's our passions for the things that we see. It's the craving for what makes me feel good and what I can gain. And then number three is our position. Notice in 1 John 2.16, it says, and pride. Underline the word pride. And pride in our achievements and our possessions. Notice Eve, she said that the fruit was desirable for gaining wisdom. This position. You see, the enemy had told her that if you would eat this fruit, you're going to be like God. The reason God doesn't want you to take this fruit is because he doesn't want you to be like him. And suddenly, Eve, because she had been tempted, because the, the temptation of her eyes and the temptation of her desires to have, now suddenly there's a temptation for her position to be more and to achieve more and to be like God. And that was never God's plan for her life. You and I, we have this sense of position and pride in our life. We like to achieve and we like to gain and we like to elevate ourselves. We like to be known. We like to be seen. We like to be heard. You want your opinion accounted for. That's why you're on Facebook and that's why you post those things and you give those uh, tidbits of information that nobody's asking for. Because we have this this temptation, this pre-existing condition, our medical history says that it is the temptations of our life. The Bible literally says it's our passion, it is our possessions, and it is our positions that we're fighting against. So today, I want to take three ways that you and I can actually combat each one of these. I want to give you a solution. I want to give you some, some, uh, some remedy. I want to give you some medicine. Let's get a health plan here together. And the first one is if you're going to overcome that passion, that inability to control the desires from your eyes, the first thing that you need to have in your life active and activated is integrity. Integrity. Look at what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. For the lips of an immoral woman are as sweet as honey, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But in the end, I think that's incredibly important to underline that statement. In the end, she is a bitter, she is as bitter as poison, as dangerous as a double-edged sword. Hey, that immoral woman, she's as sweet as honey, she's as smooth as silk, she knows just what to say. She knows just how to look. She knows how to catch your eye and get your attention and draw you in. She is literally the passion that you see, the desire that you have. But in the end, she leads to death. I want you to know today that those things that are catching your attention, those sins that are drawing you in, those videos and those images, those relationships that you should not be ha having, those text messages that you should not be receiving, and those things that you should not be sending, you need integrity in your life so that you can withstand the temptations and the pre-existing conditions that are in your medical history. It's a part of your health care plan. If you're going to overcome it, you've got to have integrity in your life. There was a soldier who went off to war, and he'd been away from his wife for a really, really long time, and he found himself constantly in temptation. And so he wrote his wife, and he said, I need something to do with my free time so that I can, I can occupy myself so I don't get into trouble. He said, I want to be faithful to you, and I want to, I want to be true to you. And she said, well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to send you a harmonica. And you can begin practicing and playing that harmonica. In all of your downtime, when you have free moments, you don't have to worry about what's going on or what you're going to do. You don't have to step into temptation because your eyes are drawing you in. You just practice and play that harmonica. That soldier came back from war, and he goes to see his wife. He hugs her. He says, I'm so excited to see you. He said, I can't wait to spend time with you. And she said, well, the first thing first, I need to hear you play that harmonica. In other words, I want to know that you've been true to me while you've been gone. 
That harmonica was your accountability. It was a sign of your integrity. Some of us need to begin learning something in our life so that we can implement some integrity. I want to give you some personal practice of what to do when your eyes are drawn to the sin and the temptation that's in your life. The first thing you need to do is you need to run from sin. This is extra. It's not on your outline, but I encourage you to write it down. You need to run from sin. Look, when temptation calls, hang up. Don't entertain it. Don't argue with it. Don't listen to it. When temptation calls you, you need to hang up. You need to run as far from temptation in your life as you can. When that website pops up, you need to cut it off. When it scrolls through your social media feed, you need to shut it off. You need to cut off that TV. You need to cut off that music. You need to run from the sin in your life. Every time you run away, you're teaching your body to comply. Every time you rest on that website, and every time you stay on that image, you're teaching your body to comply to that. You're teaching your brain, you're teaching your heart, you're teaching your emotions to be drawn to that. But every time you run away and you shut it off, you're teaching your body to comply. Secondly, you need to run to Jesus. When you run from sin, you need to run to Jesus. I love Pastor Rick Warren. He says this, before you can say no to the devil, you have to learn to say yes to Jesus. Running from it is not enough. Some of you have been running for a long time, and you've got nowhere. You're running as hard as you can run, and you're still not there. It's because you're running in the wrong direction. You're running to the wrong people. You're running to the wrong solution. You need to run to Jesus. And then the third thing I would tell you in your personal practice in building integrity, integrity is that you need to run with others. You need to run with other people. That's why we do small groups around here at Cultivate Church. It's not because it's trendy in the church world. It's not because it's, uh, we have nothing to do or we're not busy people. It's because it is valuable to our life. It is imperative in our life. If we're going to have integrity, if we're going to honor God, if we're going to overcome the pre-existing conditions of our medical history, we got to allow God to give us an operation to remove and to repair. And a portion of that means that we run in community and small groups are a great way to do that. Forgiveness comes from Jesus, but the Bible says that healing comes from confessing to one another. It's being personal in each, in each and every one of our lives. Our small group semester starts October 3rd. Our uh, directory will be available the week before that, the last Sunday of this month, and I encourage you to go ahead and make plans to be a part of a small group to help you build integrity in your life. Be a person of integrity. And I want to tell you there are lots of resources that if you're struggling with pornography, addictions in your life, if sinful lusts are continuously weighing you down, there are a lot of resources that we can give to you if you'll only let us know what you want so we can help supply you with exactly what you need. So integrity helps you overcome your passion. What helps us overcome that desire for our possession? Number two, write this down, is generosity. Generosity. 2 Corinthians 8, 7 says this, Since you excel in so many ways... In your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love from us, I want you to excel also in the gracious act of giving. Hey, look, I know you're good at everything else. You go to church. Congratulations. That's awesome, and that's important. Hey, you, you're, you're good to people. You let somebody out in traffic yesterday. That's good. That's important. That's awesome. You bought somebody's lunch. Awesome. That's good, and you're talented, and you've got these abilities, but... Really, what I want you to do is I want you to put some generosity into practice in your life. Last week, we, or a couple of weeks ago, we hosted a home makeover here in Shelby County and made over a home of a mom and a daughter, a single mom and a young girl, and it was just absolutely incredible. I felt selfish walking away, having been a part of that, because I felt so good about what we had done. It was literally, I believe, more life-changing for us 
than even life-changing for those families because of what we were able to do for someone else. We were able to provide for someone what they could not provide for themselves. It's literally the generosity of Jesus. It is the character of Jesus. It is the person of Jesus living in and through us. Jesus provided and gave something that we could not provide or give to ourselves. And because of his generosity, he gave to us. And that's what we were able to do for a family. There is nothing more freeing from the possessions of your life and from the stinginess and from the selfishness than generosity in your life. How do you be generous? How do you get there? Well, here's a few extra things. Write it down. The first I would say is you need to have a heart change. You have a heart change. Generosity is not a money issue. Generosity is a heart issue. That's right. Generosity is not a money issue. It's a heart issue. If I only had more money, well, pastor, then I would be generous. It's not true. Statistics show that people who make more money are less generous than those who don't. People who make less money are more generous, more typical. So look, I'm encouraging you today to allow God to shift your heart so that it changes from the heart and flows from out of you because it's what God has put inside of you, a heart of generosity. And then I would say you need to change your attitude. Being generous is not what God wants us to do. Being generous is who God wants us to be. You understand that? It's a change of the attitude of my life. It's not something that I am trying to do. It's someone I'm trying to be. I'm not trying to perform a function of generosity. I'm not just trying to provide actions of generosity or gestures of generosity. I'm trying to live and to be a person of generosity. And the third thing I would say is change your habits. Everything that we do is built on our habits, isn't it? You can find in your life that, man, what you're doing is based on the habits that you have. Every day you probably do the same thing. You probably think about the same things. You go to the same place. You probably eat some of the same favorite food, watch some of the same favorite shows. It's just habits in our life that we have built. Generosity must be a habit that you build in your life. Start giving instead of taking. Start serving instead of being served. Start being obedient in generosity instead of being disobedient in selfishness. Start applying uh, 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 instead of denying. Start applying instead of denying. Apply what God told us to do instead of denying what God told us to do. There's nothing like being generosity, being a part of something to know that you made a difference. When we put this facility together, there's a lot of work a lot of labor, a lot of time, a lot of sacrifice that went into this. And all these chairs that are in this room, they arrived dirty when we, they came from the factory. And they'd been on a truck, and they all had to be cleaned. And they all had to be moved dozens of times as we were in construction and setting up and, and putting it right and cleaning these things. And a guy in our church is so incredible to help do that. And on the very first Sunday that we opened up, that they were in this building sitting in those seats, his wife leaned over and she said, she said, you help clean and move and arrange all of these seats that all these people are sitting in. Isn't that cool? And he said it was cool to be in a moment to know that we had done something, something small that seemed in, in deed, but in generosity it had affected that whole room and that whole day because of their generosity. And it gives us a sense of purpose and fulfillment to where possessions for ourselves no longer are a stronghold. We're thinking about other people because if we had a heart change, an attitude change, and a habit change. And then number three, if you're going to overcome the position problem in your life, you have to have humility. You have to have humility. In Philippians 2, verse 3 and 4, here's what it says. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, underline that. Think of others, underline that word, as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. No, don't be selfish. Don't worry about impressing other people. Be humble. Think of others as better than yourself. Humility is the, it, it is the, the remedy to pride in your life. 
to lower yourself and elevate someone else. That's what we're called to do. It's what Jesus did. He lowered himself and he elevated others. I make less of me and I make more of him. And because I do that, he calls me to lower myself, less of me, and put more of other people. Humility comes from moving your place into their space. So when you get out of yourself and you get personal with people, you put them first. You get out of your space and you get into their space place. You move the focus from me to God. Move the focus from me to others. It's literally what it means to humble yourself and to make a difference. We make a difference in the lives of other people in humility by trying to make a difference in the people that are around us. We try to serve people and we try to give to people. When we opened up our facility in week one, as a lady was leaving, she was in tears and she said, Pastor, I want to tell you something. She said, today's the first day in 10 years of my life that I've been in church. She said, I was raised in church. She said, but my father, he was a pastor, but he was also my first abuser. And she said, for years I would go to church. She said, I couldn't even look at the front of the room. She said, because there was so much shame and guilt and so much anger and so much resentment. She said, I haven't stepped foot in church in 10 years. She said, but today I came in and I experienced the peace of God and the love of God and I didn't have any shame and I didn't feel any guilt and I didn't feel any pressure she said I just felt the presence of God and she said this day has changed my life and when you are on a path of trying to overcome your pre-existing conditions and you've got this medical history well when you humble yourself and you realize it means more for other people than it does for yourself it will change you forever it will keep you humble. Another lady in our church, she said this to us this past week. She said, I just want you all to know how thankful I am for this foundation. Each one of you means something special to me. I wish, that I, well, I, wish I would have found you sooner, but still so thankful for God's perfect timing. Just a family a girl always wanted. I love doing life with you all. How incredible is that? That's humbling. That is humbling. That reminds us of why we do what we do. Today, maybe you're dealing with some of these pre-existing conditions. Today, maybe it is this, uh, this drawing in your life that you can't seem to overcome. Maybe today that it is that you are dealing with the passions of your life or or even some of the possessions of your life. Or, or maybe it's the, the positioning of your life that you're struggling with. Well, there's, there's remedy for that. Today, God has provided for us. He can help you with a life of integrity. He can help you walk in a life of generosity. And He can help you achieve a place of humility. Today, I want to pray that over you. Wherever you are right now, I want you to bow your head, close your eyes, and I want to pray for you. Maybe you're watching today and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. Maybe you know about Jesus. Maybe you go to church. Maybe you watch online, but you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. And you need to get that health care plan today. I want to pray for you that today would be your day. And then maybe you're struggling in one of these areas of your life. And I want to pray that today God would help us to overcome. So will you pray with me? God, I love you today. And I thank you for all of my friends watching online. If there's one of us today that does not have a personal relationship with you, Father, my prayer is that today would be our day to say yes. Forgive us of our sin, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us the way you do. Today, Jesus, I choose to put you first in my life. And God, I pray for all of those of us who are struggling, all the people who are watching today that go, yeah, Pastor, I got some pre-existing conditions in my life. And God, I need you to help me to overcome it. I need integrity, I need generosity, and I need humility. God, I pray that over every one of us, we all need it. God, help us in the weak areas of our life so we can be who you've called us to be and do what you've called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you said yes to Jesus today, would you let us know by putting that 
on your Connect card right there online. You can actually click a link at Church Online to let us know. You can send us an email. If you're listening by podcast, send us something through social media, send us a DM, whatever it needs, whatever it needs to be for you. We just want to hear from you so that we can pray for your decision and we can give you some next steps in walking out this relationship with Jesus. Hey, before we go today, just like every week where we spend our time together, we're going to transition to a moment of giving. Right there on the screen, there's some easy ways that you can give around here at Cultivate Church. If you're our guest today, we don't anticipate you giving anything at all. We're talking about generosity today and how generosity sets us free and how generosity changes our life. This is actually uh, a biblical principle from the beginning to the end. Generosity in every area of our life, in our time, our talent, and our treasure. And so today, I want to challenge you in the place of your treasure, in the place of your giving, in the way that you honor God, you honor other people. It's not a church shakedown. We do it because we love God, because He loves us, because He blesses us, and we want to be a blessing to other people. We believe what the Bible says and how it teaches us that it already belongs to God anyway. So we're not giving anything to Him. We're just taking what He has given. We're stewarding it, and we're being a blessing to other people with it. He gives us seed for the sower. So we take the seed, the resource He gives, and we sow it. And the more we steward it, the more he gives us and the more of a harvest that comes. So thank you for being generous people, loving God and walking in obedience. Remember, obedience opens the door to blessing in your life. Well, church, I love you. Thank you again for hanging out with us here at Church Online. I'm praying you have an incredible week. I would love to see you in person at one of our campuses. But if not, as always, we'll see you right here at Church Online.